Do you want to talk about the high scalers real quick? Just what Jack O'Brien did. What I just repeat what I said. Well, no, just what they did. They would put the dynamite. Well, in my stepfather, Jack O'Brien, who worked on Boulder Dam, the, uh, his wages were raised one dollar, so he was making five dollars a day now because he became a high scaler. That for the men sat in a botswain's sailor chair to, and had ropes anchored into the boulder, side of the boulder dam and they'd push with their feet, push against the wall of the dam to, to go back and forth, back and forth, putting dynamite in the holes that had been drilled by the drillers to put dynamite so they could set it off and the, consequently the face of the dam would become smooth so they could finish their work and so they swing back and forth all day doing that. We'll stop for lunch probably, but and that's why the wages were raised, five dollars a day. So they paid them in every two weeks. And I don't remember. I would have to do some arithmetic to find out what five dollars. That would be five dollars a day for five days. Five times twenty-five a week. Twenty-five a week for that. Be that'd 50? be fifty dollars he'd bring home, approximately fifty dollars every two weeks. Wow. And Mama had to pay the all of the bills and which was hard and difficult to do. We had a, a grocery bill that like Little House on the Prairie that you just went in, ordered your groceries and they put it down on paper and then you paid on payday you paid it. So Mama had to pay part of it is all and it's all but the owner of the little store was named Johnson, my maiden name. But anyway, she'd pay what she could and let the rest of it ride on the next bill. And she had to do the hot, the landlady's, some of her work, washing clothes and so forth, to help pay for the rest of the rent. And I don't remember anything about the light bill or anything, but mm -hmm. she, it, that had to be paid. So it was kind of a tough life because like I said, Jack O'Brien would drink most of the proceeds away and come home on weekends, reeling drunk and <laughs> knocking into the furniture and stuff and stuff, things like that. And, but Mama put up with it, except she came to take care of me after I had each of the children. Well, after the triplets were born, 1942, she came to take care of me and the other children. And finally one day Jack O'Brien came over and they lived in a little house right, a little hut, a Boy Scout cabin behind the post office. And we did, they didn't have to pay rent because Mama would raise and lower the flag and do whatever chores she had to do. It would pay for the little house they lived in. So Jack O'Brien came over one day at my house at 515 Carson and said, he called her Alice all the time. He said, Alice, when are you coming home? This was your mom? Yeah, he called her Alice. When are you coming home? He said, she said, I've got a question for you, Jack. He had a flat whiskey bottle in his, in his, it was a flask. They used to call him whiskey flask. And she said, I've got a question for you. She took that flask, set it on the floor. She said, you have to choose between me and the liquor or I'm not coming home. She had, she had had her fill by then. She couldn't stand it anymore. He didn't say a word. He went over and picked up the whiskey. Mama said, get out. Get out. He had chose the whiskey. And so Mama never went back for any of her clothes or anything. She stayed with us for a while and went to work to pay for things she needed. And she and my sister stayed there until they were able to, Mama had a job until they were able to rent a little place. What year was this? Was this when you were married? Well, I said it was after the triplets were born. Oh, right. So 1942? Yeah, 42. She took care. She was such a good person. Take care of everything. And so that was the end of that. Jack O'Brien moved to, uh, well, they had, had a, uh, a hospital for the vets. Southern California, and I forget where it was, but that's. So he went there, and <clears throat> he was uh, 
probably had a little place by there who were staying. He, he got the money from the vets, veterans. He went to the grocery store. It was, it was dusk, almost dark, and he went to the grocery, little corner grocery like the 7-Eleven stores now. And he, he got his few things he needed, milk and probably cereal or something. And he was jaywalking, and it was dark. Jay walked across the street to, to go to his house. And a, a sailor came driving by came and fat, hit Jack and killed him. But they didn't cite the sailor because they were both at fault. Jack was jaywalking, and the sailor was an inebriated drunk, but he wasn't cited either because they were both at fault. And so Jack got killed then. I guess that was about 1943. I don't remember the date. But, um, and then Mama lived alone for a while, but she, she got married uh, to uh, Shorty Morris. That was the man after Jack O'Brien. She went with Shorty Morris for a while, and they got married. And they lived in Las Vegas for, for quite a while. And, and then they moved to Sacramento. That's another story, though. You won't want my story more than anything. Hey, we're up for anything. But he worked for the um, trucking company. I forgot the name of it now. But uh, they had to go over to Donner Summit. That's in the, out of, it's in the, the Sierra Nevadas on the way to, to Nevada. And he and his partner, they always had two men up to the truck. And they stopped for lunch on, on the top of Donner Summit. That's where the Donner Party were, mm -hmm. the, about the LDS stuff. And um, they stopped for lunch, and Shorty Morris, Morris, his name was really Oscar, Oscar Howard Morris. He had had, uh, I guess it would be called the flu now, but he'd gotten over it, and they were on this stop there, and right in the middle of lunch, he said, I feel like I'm getting this, getting that bad cold again, and he, he fell over in his plate. Just died of a heart attack right there. And so that was kind of bad for Mama. Anyway, I don't know what else I can tell you about our lives. Wow. So, real quick, you lived in Midas until Grandpa had a stroke in 1990... 2000. Oh, 2002. Two. Two. Okay. I think it was 2002. So from 19, 1980, we were there 22 years. Yeah, I figured, I figured that out a while ago. He, he, we lived there 22 years, and, and we tried to get... Sally and Steve came over from Utah, from Orem, and before they got there, we tried. We took Grandpa to the. Lionel Byron was visit, visiting us, from Henderson, Nevada. That's Linda's he and his son. wife and family were visiting us, for the, over the Fourth of July. They got there the third, and so he. Took Grandpa. Took him in his carried him out in his truck, took him to Winnemucca. To the hospital there, and we tried to get him into a, a rest home afterwards after he was released, but he could not. They did not have room in Reno, Winnemucca, Elko. So, Je uh, so Sally and Steve came from Orem when Grandpa had his stroke. It, we were in the hospital talking, and so she knew about the Orchard Park Care Center. And so after Grandpa was released, we took, they took him in their car with me. and, and well, the, our belongings, uh, everybody helped us with our belongings. Bill and even, even uh, Dave, uh, Dave Barney helped, helped us with our belongings. They followed in the truck behind. Anyway, they took us to Orem and that took Grandpa in the rest home. He was in a wheelchair there for two years and one month. I couldn't have him here in this house because I couldn't, no way could I lift him. Mm -hmm. I couldn't take care of him. He had to be in that rest home. So 
So you would walk there every day, wouldn't you? Twice a day. In the morning, I'd go for about two hours and help him with lunch and stuff because he was paralyzed in his right arm and partially paralyzed in his left. He had his right arm strapped down to the wheel wheelchair. And so helped him with his meal and visited with him for about two hours. Then I'd come home for my own lunch and I'd go back about two o'clock, stay a couple more hours. For two years, I took, and you won't believe the cost. Now his insurance company, the Ironworks, would not pay for anyone in, in a rest home. That was against their policy. So I had to pay it out of my pocket, $3,500 every month. I almost got to the poor house by the time. <laughs> and so, but I did, I paid it out of my own pocket. And it's a good thing Sally and Steve found this house. It's so close to the Orchard Park, I could walk over every day. Wow. And, because I gave up my driving when I moved here. I was 80. And Grandpa was 89 when he had the stroke. Mm -hmm. So, and when I moved into the, my home here, it was August 31st, 2002. Before that, I, I lived with Sally and Steve for six weeks. And this house, August 31st, Janice, S Sally Michelle's mother, helped me move in, and so she stayed all night with me on on the 31st. So that was, so I've been here seven years in this house. Wow. Doesn't feel like that long. <laughs> well, it doesn't in a way, but I've been alone. And Joseph said I could wheel him in the wheelchair. I'd wheel him outside of the park, of the orchard park, on, wheel him on the sidewalk and around the park. They had sidewalks. Mm -hmm. They still do. I go over there now all the time. Not all the time, but anyway, uh, Joe said, well, Grandma, why don't you wheel him home to your house, which I could have done. But I said, I'm not going to, because in his mind, he would have thought, boy, I'm getting out of here. I don't have to go back there anymore. <laughs> so I said, I won't do that, Joseph. He'll think he's been released. And of course, he wasn't in his right mind. Half the time, he didn't know I was there. And um, But on other days, he'd know I was there. He'd fall asleep in his wheelchair, and I'd implore them, put him to bed, and of course they were short-handed. They wouldn't put him to bed, he'd fall asleep in his wheelchair. Many of the time, I'd, and it took two men to lift him in bed, or lift him out into the wheelchair. They forgot to tie, they had a strap around his waist to snap him in, in his wheelchair. They forgot that, and he fell out of it. And I think he, he didn't really break his arm, but it kind of dislocated his shoulder or something. Because they should always pay attention to what they're doing, even though they're short-handed, you know. Mm -hmm. One day I walked in there. After they'd taken him to, they had to take him into Provo for, to have his, have everything checked. And I came in there, <coughs> I looked around, I said, I went to their, where is his catheter? He had to have a catheter. And she said, oh, we forgot to put it back on. Oh, my golly. He went all day without going to the bathroom. And finally, the nurse came in and, you know, took, emptied the bladder herself. I says, how much did you get out of there? She said, not a very good thing to talk about, I guess. But <laughs> I said, how much? She said, so many liters. I said, in American language, how much did you get out of there? And she said, oh, about two quarts. I said, oh, you've got to be kidding. That's the, twice they forgot to put the catheter in, and I about, I about blew the ceiling off, the, off of the <laughs> orchard park. <laughs> uh, so I guess it was a good thing I went over there to visit, because otherwise no one would have noticed. Mm -hmm. Real quick, we have about five minutes left or well, so. Well, there's not too much. I, I, discuss about everything but what I was supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been perfect. But real quick, I'd like you to, to talk about mm -hmm. you were able to, to get your endowment and go to the temple and stuff. And I, well, that was through Sally. Me and she lives so close. I walk over there every day because she lives, lives six blocks from me. And she made arrangements for us, to, for me to get my endowments. And I did. And consequently, after that, 
and I have to see your husband or wife has to be dead for a year before you can get it done to have your children sealed to you. So when Bill was over here, Bill and his family, well, Bill represented my husband, and we were married in the temple. And then on the same day, Bill represented the, the male triplet. And the two girls, Shanna and Sally, represented the two girl triplets. And, and Sally and Shanna were sealed to me, and Bill, and then, then, uh, then the triplets were sealed. So we, everybody, but Linda someday, my oldest daughter Linda will be, but, but she was smoking at the time, and she can't go to the temple to smoke. I think you have to have everything right, and I think she's quit now, and she's trying to be good so she can uh, have her own endowments someday, and I want her to become sealed to me before I go. And there can tell. My friend turned, she's 10 years older than myself, she turned 97. She's in a rest home north of here. And she turned 97. She still walks every day and just the same thing as my, myself. And so, but I'm 87 and, and you never know when the end comes. You could be walking across the floor and fall over with a heart attack. Being as I had a heart, heart trouble and still have to take medication for my heart. But I have a stout, like that song, Stout Hearted Men. Uh, I'm able to do all my work, housework, and and thanks to Shanna, I'm on Meals on Wheels. She got me on that. You have to be interviewed for that. So I really am fortunate to have my children around and, and Bill, all of them, and my grandchildren. I have, will always have, 29 grandchildren. Sally Michelle's my youngest grandchild. My oldest grandchild is 51, Kathy. And my oldest daughter will be 70 in December. Wow. 70, 69, 68 will be their ages. And so I have 70 great-grandchildren and five great-great-grandchildren. What a legacy. Don't ask me to name them. <laughs> too, too many. Too many. Although I think Sally Michelle's Grandma Miller has more I know she has more grandchildren than I have. I think she had probably about the same amount of great-grandchildren. Probably. There's over, a little over 70. And I'm going to have two more. Um, Charlene is pregnant. And also, I think Brecca is pregnant. Really? So she's going to have two more coming Franklin up. And Jessica are having one in October. And Jessica, don't forget her. Yeah. Well, there'll be three more. Well, Grandma, if there's anything, if you could... What would you like people to remember about you most? Okay, one thing I thought about the, just the other day, and I, I'm going to tell Shanna, have put in my obituary that I was born in a boxcar, you know. Mm -hmm. And also I've got a wonderful, fa wonderful family. What would I do if I moved it, lived in New York? I'd have no help, hardly, <laughs> except Meals on Wheels. <laughs> <laughs> mm. oh, Grandma. But I'm very fortunate indeed. I go over to Sally's, my Sally's, to do the indexing, indexing and I'm now on 71,500 lines, plus the 45,000 lines I did last year. But I think that's, that's the only thing I know about a computer. Is that I can't get my mail or anything through it. <laughs> but you're doing work for others through indexing, helping them get their family history. And I make those little squares. I, I haven't got done any of that sewing since Stan left because I just can't get in the mood yet. <laughs> I got so kind of tired when I had, he and I get along good, but um, he has his system and I've got mine, you know, like he doesn't like the radio. Because he's reading, he can't have any outside music. Now that's when I read the best, but I've got the radio going. <laughs> so. All right. Well, thank you, Grandma. You're welcome. I hope I've said a little bit. It was perfect, I promise. I would love to keep going 